Hi, my name is Francis Davis. Welcome this evening. It's good to um, have you all here for this debate put on as part of the Hampshire Festival of the Mind, which is a fantastic event taking across the whole of the month. We've got a distinguished panel of policy makers, of politicians, and we're going to be debating questions of mental health, mental wealth, mental illness, and the opportunities of health and social care. I run the Cathedral Innovation Centre up the road, and we're going to start off just by letting each of our distinguished panellists introduce themselves tonight. Dr Janet Maxwell, I'm Director of Public Health at Portsmouth City Council. I'm Flick Drummond, I'm the Conservative candidate in Portsmouth South. I'm Richard Barrett and I'm Chief Executive of Sown Mind, the mental health charity. I'm Sue Castillon, I'm Labour's uh, Portsmouth South candidate for next year and I've lived and worked in Portsmouth tw over 20 years now. <coughs> I'm Darren Sanders, I'm a Liberal Democrat councillor in Portsmouth City Council, I'm also the party's parliamentary candidate for Portsmouth North. I'm replacing my colleague Gerald Vernon Jackson, who is on holiday with his mum, um, and so sends his apologies for <coughs> not being. I'm Ruth Dixon. I'm Deputy Director of Adult Services with Hampshire County Council. Uh, Dr. Tad Thompson. I'm the Clinical Director for um, Adult Mental Health in Solent. Richard, you lead a voluntary sector organisation. It's all over to you. Uh, good place to start with, uh, uh, with um, funding. And uh, I think the voluntary sector may be part of the answer, but please don't <coughs> underestimate how much the voluntary sector depends on its statutory funders, its public sector funders, in order to, uh, to do uh, its job. And I think the, my view is all the assumptions about the big society stepping in where uh, the state was withdrawing from uh, have just have just not happened. Now, uh, Mind, the National Mental Health Charity, uh, has published uh, its manifesto for the uh, forthcoming uh, election, and it's asking for another 10% to come into uh, mental health uh, expenditure over the five years of the of the Parliament starting uh, next year, 2015, and. Um, if that sounds uh, greedy, it is worth bearing in mind that mental health has lost out compared with other health issues uh, in terms of funding over uh, the last uh, few years. And there's huge concern in the mental health world and politicians, national politicians, are beginning to talk about this issue of parity. Uh, the, if you look at uh, uh, mental illness and the consequences of mental illness, and if you add up the cost of that in terms of personal health, but also uh, to the economy, we are, not, uh, we are nowhere near <coughs> investing uh, the kind of sums that, that we should. And mental health loses out to, I mean, some very you know, worthy issues, cancer and so on, but mental health routinely loses out uh, to physical health uh, in terms of funding. And I just would just add, it isn't just about NHS uh, funding, this is about local authority funding as well. Local authorities fund uh, social care, so uh, lots of the kind of employment related day services, uh, housing related services uh, are funded by local authorities, not the NHS. And local authorities have not been protected uh, over the last four years from any of the cuts. And what we've seen in most local authorities, not all, but most local authorities, is uh, some pretty severe cuts. So that if you go to some places not very far away from Portsmouth, there are no day services, or day services have been cut back so much that they're, they're pretty well uh, worthless. So I think funding is a huge issue, uh, and I think we should make it even more of an issue for the forthcoming election. Okay, so I'm going to come to Ruth next. So funding is a huge issue, uh, and perhaps you'd like to then say how you feel about that, but also perhaps the relative costs of in-house versus out-of-house provision, um, and, and how that's gone in terms of commissioning if, if statutory comes. Yes, um, you, you're right Sue, funding is a real issue in mental health services and, um, and as Richard said, local government has um, not been protected and, and social care hasn't been protected from the um, economic 
downturn and the constraints on public spending. So we have had to take a significant amount of money out of adult services budgets. Um, in Hampshire, we have tried to protect the mental health budget, but just a recognition that it is a small budget anyway, um, and it is a budget that hasn't grown over the years, and we've, we've not made any significant cuts um, in that budget today. And we have tried to use the money that we've got as effectively as we can. Um, and certainly, making that small amount of money work in the best possible way it does involve working in, in partnership um, with the voluntary sector because um, certainly in terms of the provision of the voluntary the provision of support in the community the voluntary sector is in a very good place um, in, in terms of cost to provide those services more effectively and I think actually um, the voluntary sector and certainly our relationship with voluntary sector pr providers um, suggest to us that actually they can often do it better than statutory services, um, are more in touch with a, um, a service user perspective and able to, to develop services that are more service user led than some of the in-house provision that we provide as a local authority. So that partnership is really key to us. But we could use more, more money to invest in, in adult social care, but um, the democratic process elected um, a government that, that doesn't um, want to invest in the sorts of public services that um, that previously we've been able to maintain at a particular level. So Darren, your government, um, led by Mr Alexander in the Treasury, one of the great enthusiasts for retrenchment, doesn't want to invest. So how can we address that going forward in this space? With well, it's a, it's a coalition government, so I hope we have some answers um, to, these, to these things. Um, we as Liberal Democrats are committed to making sure Britain's budget is balanced by the middle of the next parliament. After that, we will increase spending. What we're interested in is looking at different ways of working. I'm currently looking at a report on how people are being <coughs> discharged from hospital, often at one of the weakest points of their life cycle. And we find that people don't talk to each other because there are different computer systems. We find that professionals in sheltered housing have absolutely are told that they can't access the, the hospital records of the person being discharged because they're not the next of kin. We're being told that people in hospital are, for instance, not being given the reasons why they can't go into the home of their choice. Part of the problem is the system isn't working and there are still too many bureaucratic barriers. We need to carry on the sort of things that this government has started by pooling budgets. I'm a great believer in the integration of the health and social care system. I think it will create more problems than our Labour colleagues who also back it <coughs> think it will. But I think that's the way we have to go. We have to look at pooling budgets and we have to treat mental health in the round. You're absolutely right. Until the 2012 Health and Social Care Act introduced by the government of which my part is part, mental health was the Cinderella service. When Labour introduced rightly waiting times uh, in government, it didn't apply to mental health. We want to try and make it apply to it now. It's about treating it properly, and that means integrating care much more, pooling budgets much more, and having a pragmatic approach to who is the best provider. I don't mind if it's the state, if it's the council, or if it's a private provider, or if it's a voluntary sector provider. I don't mind. I just want to make sure it delivers the best value for money. I've been told that Portsmouth City Council has to save £6 million in its adult social care budget. Its budget is going to happen next month. Um, I don't want that to happen. I want there to be much more imaginative ways. I want the Conservative and Labour Party to put together a joint budget for the city to come up with more imaginative ways of doing it. But you being told that the NHS can't do anything and the voluntary sector should do everything is wrong. Everybody has to work together, everybody has to think much more cleverly than they've done before, much more imaginatively than they've done before, rather than have IT systems that don't talk to each other and care professionals who are not allowed to have hospital records. If that means more money, so be it. So, Dr. Thompson. I would really like to speak to some of those points. Okay. Um, first of all, one thing I should say is that I am really very... politics. My interest in politics is very minimal. Um, my interest is in getting the best care for the patients that I have, and I work on the front line. I'm not a bureaucrat, I'm a, I'm a clinician, I see patients. I'm <coughs> service. Now, 
Okay, so because I have very little, I have very little patience for people, you know, for MT rhetoric. We're saying there's no cuts, and that's true, but it doesn't take into account one, two things. One, the fact that there is a four percent deflator that we have to deal with every year, in which case there is no actual cut, but there is there is a cut, there is a de facto cut because we have less money to work with. The second thing is that there is an assumption when we say there are no cuts, there is an assumption that it means that it was adequately funded in the first place when it was not. There has to be an analysis of that. Um, to talk about discharges, I mean, okay, now, we have computer systems, we work across, across, you know, Portsmouth and Southampton and everything. We have computer systems that actually do talk to each other. That's not really the problem with discharges at all. The computer systems talk to each other. We have information that we can access to each other. We have discharge meetings where we invite people. It is actually not true that people can't talk to each other if they are not the next of kin the relevant information is given to the relevant person. So the person is going to an accommodation, they will be invited to what is known as a care program approach meeting, and everything that is relevant to that person's transfer will be discussed. That's not the problem. Part of the problem is that there is actually no money to fund accommodation for people. It's not that they're not talking to each other. Professionals are talking to each other. I did that just today, and it is routinely done. It is routinely done. Uh, to say that there are... <laughs> To say that there are bureaucratic barriers, those barriers are not there. We are already doing a lot of reconfiguration gymnastics. We do it all the time. Uh, talk about how to get things to work better with each other. This is happening. We do cost improvement programs. But we are shaving everything down to the bone. After a while, there will be nothing left. And we have to ask hard questions like, what do you expect us to do with what you are giving to us? That's really the way I see it. And to talk about waiting times, we have waiting times. It does apply to us. We have, you know, we work under the same constraints of waiting times and that's not that isn't the problem if you give us more staff we will be able to bring the waiting times down we're working smart examine us we invited the CQC they've been to see us they've been to see what we do we do it as best as it can be done in the rest of the country for example there's a bed crisis about mental health beds we don't have that because we work efficiently here we don't have that here in Portsmouth but honestly we don't have enough to do what we would like to do and if you go go into the hospitals, we can invite you to go in there and speak to people. The staff there are very dedicated and very hard working and they do talk to each other. We just don't have what we need. I've been told this week, for example, that in Richmond Fellowship, the amount of care that was there before, um, Richmond Fellowship is the kind of place where people, um, people who have left the hospital can go in and there's staff there to monitor their progress. Initially, prior to about a month ago, what we had is about eight hours a day the staff would be there. I've been told that it's been reduced this week to 12 hours a week, which means that all of our patients who are there, who have moved there, now have less care than they would have had, and that all of that has to be reviewed again. So it isn't, it, it, this isn't, it, it's easy to say things like, okay, there's a problem with the disruptors. That is not the problem. We need more. We're, be, we're being asked to do more with less. It's not just less with nothing. You know, that's, that's my opinion. More with less. Okay, I'm going to start from the other end because my background is youth and community work and when Andy Burnham announced joining up the services, <coughs> National Health Service, Public Health, Social Care and the voluntary sector, it was music to my ears when he said we'll be looking at whole person care and they will individually be managing their own personal budgets and as Rachel Perkins said this morning in her speech, we need to tap into the expertise of human experience in the community, um, looking at peer support programmes. So to an extent, I do agree with you, Darren, the joined up approach. We have a wealth of expertise, in a sense, out there in the community to support people um, with mental health and difficulties or mental illness. It's just coordinating that and activating that to support people in the community. And also the support to the voluntary sector in this city are struggling. They're struggling for funding. I worked at the Off the Record Youth Counselling Agency and their vital support service. Often the voluntary sector delivers sometimes a high quality standard uh, um, to the community and especially with mental health and also Labour are saying that mental health will be at the heart of their NHS social care 
um, programme. We are going to be investing two and a half billion pounds in the NHS, but with this joined up approach, so that the the mental health sector is equal to all the other sectors because I believe that we progress through our lives in a holistic way your physical affects your emotional affects your social there's their own environmental factors come in also your housing if you're in damp housing the stress of everyday living who of us could ever so, you know, so put the hands up and say we have felt really down really low so we've all experienced this so we were all exper experts in our own field in this field and I think it's harnessing that energy they're out there that the, the projects are out there as Rachel Perkins was saying this morning and she was saying that, that it got results because they were managing their own personal budgets they felt in charge of their own care, of their own health, and moving forward. Flick. Oh, I thought I was going to be the one to with all that. Yeah, I think mental health has been a poor relation for a very long time, but there's a growing realisation in Parliament that it, it has been underfunded, and I think with the MPs coming forward and uh, you know, admitting that they've had mental health problems themselves, I think it's going to start changing. Um, and I was delighted to see that the Chief Medical Officer in his annual report on mental health um, just this September has said that it really should be funded on, a, on the same level as physical health. Um, so many of us you know, uh, are, have um, problems with mental health um, throughout our lives and it goes up and down, I know, and so it's very, very important. Um, I am very keen on the voluntary sector. I, do, I think they do a fantastic job and often much better than the um, public sector. So people like Mind, um, Time to Change, Time to Change has got, had a massive impact on trying to get rid of the stigma of mental health. And so those sort of organisations, I would like to see funding going through them. Um, obviously the NHS, I mean... Um, um, Sue talks about uh, you know, that Labour going to put 2.5 billion into the NHS, while well, we've put 12.7 billion into the NHS since, the, since we've been in power. Um, it's, it's, a, it's minuscule, really, in the whole scheme of things. It's an endless pot, as you know, the NHS is always going to be a tricky issue. But uh, I think there's a lot to do on that. Um, I went to QA this morning to see us at award, and I agree with you about beds. Um, in Portsmouth, it's very good. Um, and they're very good at passing it on and getting the integrated care. Um, and that's what I would like to see as, as the whole package would be the voluntary sector and the public sector working together very much with integrated care. And I hope, and I will be campaigning for, to get more funding, in more parity anyway, with, with the, uh, the physical, um, physical care. Um, because it is an, increasingly, an increasing problem, particularly in Portsmouth. Yes, I'd like to pick up on what we've heard about integration and holistic care, because the interesting thing for me is the, the Western medical system, um, which was devised some time ago, actually split <coughs> mental health and physical health um, apart right at the very beginning. So we've had separate training programmes, um, we've had separate organisations, we've now got separate trusts, um, and we've got separate funding streams. And I think what we've heard about holistic approach actually is where we need to be. Um, and I'd also like to refer to the Chief Medical Officer's report um, because this year her medical report focused completely around mental health. Um, not mental sickness, mental health. And <coughs> it was about the importance of um, prevention of, of poor mental health, promotion of good mental health and services. And at the moment, because of the way the services are divided, we tend to, as soon as somebody says mental health, we kind of home in on services. And actually, we need to stand back and think, what is it that keeps our mental health and well-being good? And the opportunity now, um, the, one of the biggest changes that's happened in the latest reorganisations of the, of the health and care system is that the responsibility for improving the health of the population has moved back out of the health services, where it's been for the last 40 years or so, back into the local authority, where we have a better opportunity to have an overview of all the things that underpin people's well-being, or the, um, the, the opposite of that. 
So we've had a recent national strategies very much promoted and much more coming together and building people's resilience. So we've had um, strategies like no health without mental health to bring the kind of physical and mental health together. And we've had the, the um, Chief Medical Officer's report which talks very much about building that resilience. And this coming week in Portsmouth, we will be having um, the, uh, we're launching what's called a new Mental Health Alliance. So, and that's bringing together all parties who've got involvement in, in um, wanting to take this new strategy forwards of building personal resilience. And by building, building individuals' resilience and capacity to deal with the kind of ups and downs of life, actually we then empower whole communities to be more resilient um, and actually create environments that, that are more healthy. So that will be the way going forward. And the opportunities now to start integrating budgets and pooling budgets gives us an opportunity to really operate in a much more holistic way. Because at the moment we're seeing the, the NHS services for people with physical illnesses really struggling. But actually if you go right back to the beginning, it's as we heard before, it's actually people's um, uh, uh, mind and well-being and emotional things that actually is a key driver of whether you choose healthy lifestyles or risky behaviour that then drives your physical health. So we cannot separate them anymore. We've got to see them together right from the very beginning, right from childhood, right the way through adolescence, right into mental health, um, adulthood and into old age. They need to be fully integrated. So we need full integration. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. Just on a point of information, are beds okay for under 18? Or, or for adults? That's, it's for adults. I'm speaking only for adults. Yeah. Then, but I do know, I can say that I do, they're not okay for under 18s. The critical age the critical age gap where there's nothing is basically between the ages of 16 and 18. That's not well funded for, and that's a, it's a big problem. Okay, so that's a big problem to challenge. Now, on this next one, I'm going to come to Sue and to Flick, and then rather than go around the whole panel, throw it open here for a bit and then come back in. And Sarah Haskett has a question. Services are being contracted out more to independent providers. Is is this a means of privatising services through the back door? Sue. So. Um, mm, it could possibly be. It could probably <coughs> be. It depends on who they're contracting out and who they invite in for tender. Um, I'm not particularly an advocate of going out to tender uh, for some of the services because I believe that we have we have the answers to the, <coughs> to these services within our community so I would very much favor the um, uh, voluntary sector again and looking at the voluntary sector rather that, than private companies to deliver health health services and we at Labour actually do believe that the NHS should be the preferred provider. So I'm coming from a position of, yes, go out to tender, but mainly to NHS or, or maybe the voluntary sector. Um, but, but, but I wouldn't want to see that creep in privatisation that we've got in the NHS now that's disintegrated the service anyway. So um, I'm okay. not an advocate of privatising the NHS. So Flick and then Sarah, you can respond to both, yeah? So Flick. Um, well, if it, if it was the NHS, they presumably wouldn't go out to tender. I mean, I think I hinted at it before in the last answer that it, I really am in favour of the voluntary sector or the third sector because I do think they offer a better service in some, in some respects. Obviously, you need to look at the whole package to see whether it is actually going to do it, and then there needs to be controls to make sure that it's actually delivered. So I would, um, if it's going to be better than the NHS, if it's going to be cheaper in some respects, then I think that is a, it's a good thing. Um, if we can get MIND or, I mean, if you see it in other areas, Action for Children, for instance, do a lot of uh, child services in Hampshire, a lot cheaper and perhaps and a lot better. But obviously the proof is in the pudding, so you have to make sure it has to be monitored, as it would under the NHS as well. So, yeah. 
Um, I mean, MENCAP deliver learning disability services in Southampton for one fifth of the cost it's delivered in house over here, which is just an interesting benchmark. But what do you think? Do you think the world's going down the market? I was just going to say, is it, is it not the case um, that there are areas of the NHS currently that are already in, in having other companies bringing their staff in to work amongst the NHS services that we provide? Um, so in terms of catering, cleaning, um, and some support services that are being used, they're not being employed by the NHS. Um, and therefore, that area of our service has been privatised. So does anyone here know people receiving privatised support services or care services? No. But I think, I think you've got a sound point. I mean parts of hospitals run by Care UK now, for example, rather than by Mind or by some social enterprise. I mean, statistically, in the English NHS, the, the role of the private sector in delivering services has been increasing for the last few years, including under Labour, and it's now about a billion of the over 100 billion spend in English NHS is contracted <coughs> with, with the private sector. And the practice is going one way. So that's behind the term of creepy privatisation. The graph is growing steadily uh, upward. Okay, so privatisation is on its way. So <coughs> if I could just make a point, uh, the Health and Social Care Act that was brought in in 2013 um, brought in any qualified provider so that services have to be looked at very rigorously by the clinical commissioning groups and unless they can justify not going out to open tender, they are, um, they, sorry, I don't know if I said that right. They're, they're supposed to look and open it up to tender unless they can justify giving it within us on the basis of quality and cost of service. So there is a huge pressure on the clinical commissioning groups to actually put out services to tender, open tender. It is creeping privatisation. And, mm. and if it is allowed to continue, it will inevitably end up with a privatised set of services because the NHS isn't always the cheapest provider. But mm. we can be assured of the quality of the service that the NHS mm. gives. Mm. That's an interesting, an interesting point. Anyone want to comment on that one before we move on to the next question? No, so can I ask... Um, oh, oh, yeah, I'm just gone. Murray. So, around young people uh, and providers. Um, if, lo if public health is now both in local authorities, and local authorities <coughs> are moving around, cutting, a lot of the services are going, off the record's gone, health and driven development services getting cut, schools are going out to academies. Young people's any sort of sense of a framework, or policy there, it's a postcode that's just exponential, postcode lottery that's exponentially growing. So I think if we are going to look at a holistic solution, it's maybe just saying give it to the voluntary sector, because lots of people, the professionals are being sacked, maybe redundant, and you now having professionals going in, getting voluntary job experience. <laughs> it's a very dangerous <coughs> situation. So I think the funding issue, the local authority issue with the public health agenda, you can't keep pulling cords down and cutting if you can't <coughs> Okay. Yeah, go on this one. The other important thing about the, the public health agenda is actually an opportunity to think much more upstream. So instead of waiting for young people to become mentally unwell and needing mental health services, we can actually do far more uh, at an earlier age. We do. Uh, we have come over with a ring-fenced um, budget for the next year or so, but th th we don't know how long it will last. It's not a huge amount of money, but it gives us an opportunity to start investing that money um, as upstream as we can in terms of the work we do around um, the, the, the pre-birth um, pre to five-year-old agenda of doing much more support for parents uh, of bringing up their children more safely um, uh, before school. And we do, we've got an opportunity to remodel the whole school agenda in terms of help schools being a health promoting environment um, and helping children through adolescence in terms of the PHSE, the relationships, the, the health promoting environment um, and, and do, equipping young people to deal with the, the vicissitudes of life ahead. 
We also have the opportunity to bring in funding from elsewhere. And the key funding at the moment is around the economy um, and around skills and apprenticeship for preparing people for work. So we now have a whole stream of money, and this is, we're talking millions of pounds here, um, in terms of the city deal that's come to Southampton and Portsmouth, of helping supporting people with health needs um, to be able and ready to, to take up work and employment. So now we're, we're starting up pilot work to, to look what that looks like um, and what you know, health needs need, need addressing and how and what that support should look like. So it's an opportunity, I think, when, although we, you know, we fear for about budgets being cut, of thinking about things more creatively, more creatively and, and more upstream of, of building resilience and, and, and building good mental health rather than um, worrying all, always about uh, downstream services. That, that supports the Labour policy of <coughs> making personal, social and health education mandatory on the national curriculum, which is something I'm passionate about, having worked with young people in schools. On We're going to come to schools in a second. OK. So can I just let you respond quickly, just in case the Director of Public Health endorsed the Labour position without knowing it and is going to go back and get in trouble or anything like that? So. <laughs> Are you relaxed with that? You won't. That's fine. <laughs> okay. No, that's all right. I know. No officials getting risky. Uh, Linda Panta has a question about schools and young people. Thank you. Um, now that existing services for children and young people have been reduced, what other ways do the panel think that mental health awareness can be raised um, among children? And young people? Can we start with public health, because that's a speciality the, the of it. One of the um, areas of responsibility um, for the public health team is the Healthy Child Programme. There's a national programme of making sure all children from birth right through to 19 um, have good support, and that's both mental and, and, and physical health. So that's the, the money we'll be investing in redeveloping <coughs> and redesigning our health visitor service, um, working much more closely with the children's services and children's centres, and the school nursing service that um, currently still operates in schools and reinvigorating the whole healthy school program that did have funding until a while ago and then stopped. We've got an opportunity to refresh that. So schools, as they become more independent from the, from the, with the council, have budgets and they have school premiums which can, we can um, start using to strengthen that health promoting um, atmosphere in schools and, and, and help us with that um, agenda. Uh, Richard, do you want to comment on that one quickly? Yeah, um, uh, we uh, we do uh, a lot of mental health awareness work in schools in uh, as a part of Hampshire in the New Forest, where uh, we got some charitable funding actually uh, to go into schools. So my colleague um, Abby, who is a young woman who has had bipolar, she's been through the worst of all times and come out the other side, and she is able to talk about her experiences and uh, with you know some some passion and she gets uh, uh, youngsters talking about and thinking about mental health issues um, and I think that's just such an important thing to be able to do uh, for uh, kids in schools that you know the rest of the adult population <coughs> we still have this huge problem of stigma which uh, gets in the way of people getting jobs, it gets in the way of people seeking treatment. So I think there's a huge piece of work that, you know, pretty well all of us on the panel uh, can be doing around raising mental health awareness uh, uh, in schools and addressing uh, stigma and picking up on the degree of uh, mental ill health that many children suffer from. And if you uh, you know, you ask some organisations, Young Minds for example, will say it's about one in ten young people are suffering from a diagnosable uh, mental health problem. So uh, if we're, you know, interested uh, in the future, if we can persuade politicians to look beyond not just the next nine months to the election, not just the next uh, five years through the next parliament, but on into, you know, the second half of the uh, 21st century, then start with kids, absolutely. Um, Darren wanted to come in on this one. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it's something my party will be discussing in our conference in Glasgow this week. Um, we have two particular things that we're interested in. People are particularly worried about bullying in schools and bullying online. And so we want to see one person within a school, a named person, whose responsibility it is to talk through and to deal with those cases. At the moment, people just don't... You know, 
kids don't feel they've got anyone to go to, any anyone to go to. You remember the the situation the kid who was always picked on in the playground. I used to see it when I went to school in George Street in in Fratton. And you started to think, well, who could help that person? It wasn't going to be other kids because they were often as scared of the bullies as that person. So it should be someone in responsibility who's a named person to deal with it. And the second thing is to put mental health and well-being on the national curriculum because that will force schools to take it seriously and <coughs> give it parity of esteem with everything else. Because Janet's right, um, wellness is absolutely crucial to making sure you've got children who emerge well at the end of it. If you feel run down, if you feel bullied, if you feel worried about home, if you feel worried about life, that's one of the things you have to look at. One of the other things that's sort of related to this that we want to look at is making sure that young carers are entitled to the, what's called the pupil premium, uh, which is the policy that our policy introduced with our Conservative colleagues in government, um, which actually allows essentially kids with schools with poor kids <coughs> to get the sort of money rich kids have always had. And we want to extend that to young carers. We want to increase it to a thousand pounds a year by 2020. Um, and that way, that will also help schools provide work, more assistance for young carers. So let's put it on the curriculum, give, give a named person to deal with the, the bullying that occurs, and also give young carers a bit more space as well so they can look after people at home and not take it into schools. Flick, there's now a, a minister for CAMS at the Department of Education. Why? Did that happen? Well, because I think we've recognised, as I said earlier, you know, that politicians are beginning to realise what an issue mental health is. Um, and so we are putting, I think we've put 22 million into schools purely to look at the mental health issues. Um, I completely disagree with you, Darren, on schools. We've got four, I'm a governor at a school where we have four um, inclusion managers who are actually looking at uh, in the emotional uh, um, development of children. And I know that in secondary schools they have a counsellor too. So it's obviously changed since your day. No, well, they do. Um, and I've been <coughs> in schools and there they are. Um, and they've used the pupil premium, which um, you know, your, the Lib Dems did introduce and the Conservatives agreed with, um, to also help children with mental health problems as well. Um, I was at the party conference and I went to the MIND um, uh, uh, um, fringe meeting and there was a young man there who was actually talking about transition as being the hardest thing between schools and moving between schools. Um, and so I would like to see more money being put into that area, and that's something which I know I'm going to be campaigning on. Um, someone else mentioned about, um, you, yeah, saying what exactly I was going to say, about talking about mental health in schools to get rid of the stigma. So if you start very early on, and I know there will be children in the schools who are carers whose, ch whose parents have got mental health problems, and so to help them talk through it, I think, would be very helpful. So perhaps we... We do have PHSC in schools, and it's been in schools for a very long time, but then perhaps they ought to be looking at more about the mental health um, and how to bring that into the curriculum as well. So those are some of the things which I think would be really important and I would certainly be campaigning for. Okay. Just, just, sorry, <coughs> just to support what's been said, um, having worked in schools with young people on the PSHE programme, that holistic approach to health and well-being, young people respond really positively to. So looking at your psychological, your emotional, your creative side, the whole person side again, young people are really take it on board and really look at that as part of their own personal development and preparation for the outside world and work. Okay. I just want to say something then. about stigma. Um, stigma, we're not going to solve stigma the issue of stigma by only talking to children. It's, it's a lot wider than that. And if we don't actually engage with the media, talking about the mass media, the people who write our soap operas, the people who write our music, our songs, the children spend more time with the media than they do listening to <coughs> us talk to them directly. So if you don't engage with the media, they will listen to that for an hour, if you can get them to sit down that long, and then they'll go and listen to whoever they need to listen to, Katy Perry. You have to engage the media in a very serious way. It's not enough for us to say that, yes, we are now prioritizing mental health. It is an entire society thing. And to be honest, if you think about it, stigma is part of the reason why we're where we are in terms of funding. Because the people who are lawmakers today are the people who were students yesterday. And they were all subject to the same stigma. So to them, it's like, it's mental health. Let's keep that aside. It doesn't exist. You know? So it has to actually start 
it has to go further than that. And it's not just the kids, but also their families. So whatever it is that we're doing, we have to involve more than just targeting the children. We have to target the entire families and the media that feeds, in, feeds into the minds of the families. But, but don't you think time to change has started to help that? And I do. Yeah. I do. And that, that's the holistic thing. We just, yeah. Can you say something? Yeah, yeah, far away. What you're saying, Doctor, I would, from my side of it, is I'm a carer for my daughter. I would like the doctors and the carers to speak to one another instead of speaking directly to the patient because therefore you're not hearing what's going on and everything, but yet we are the ones that have to look after them when they're discharged from hospital. I agree. And just briefly to address that, unfortunately or fortunately there are laws that we have, to, you know, we are hamstrung by yes, certain I, laws. Yes, I do understand um, that. But there's certain, time, meetings, there's certain meetings that the carer is allowed to go to that is, I'm not <coughs> always being, allowed, being asked to go. But you are and I've allowed. Gone, my daughter has asked me personally, and I have been t refused by some of the hospital staff for sitting in on the meeting. Okay. Now, mm. I can't speak to that specific instance because no, no, I don't I know about it, but yeah. what I do know is this. Even if the hospital staff are not allowed to tell you something because they yeah. have been forbidden yeah. to do so, they are allowed to listen to you, and you have a right to be heard. So, aside from the meetings that they're When you can get a nursing staff. Well, St. James, as you I walk in that corridor, I was right down to my daughter's room and there was no members of staff around. I would strongly suggest that if that is happening, you should complain. But it is your right to be heard. Because you are, like you said, you're the one caring you know, for the person. You, you, you have a right to be heard and they have to listen to you. It's not optional. They have to. Theoretically. Theoretically. Well, and all not the in they have to. sitting in their, their little room, uh, watching things on computer, nothing to do with their work on Facebook, on other channels on the computer, you ask to disturb them. Oh, I'm busy, I'm busy. If they need is, to get out of that office and work with the patients. Mr. So James, there is there is a matron. You can ask to speak to the matron. Yes, so I have. Yes. I have spoken to him, but it still doesn't work. It's we've been involved now twelve years and it's still not working. Okay, well speak to me after this and give me the particulars. And perhaps that's something other people can think about in the context of the... Thank you. No, 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 it's, ab it's absolutely fine. Sorry. I know what you're talking about. When, when my family member was on the unit, you could never get anyone during an England match because they all went down to the yes. common room. But that was all right because they let me join in. But there we are. So, but Maggie Sawkins has a, has a question which links to this kind of challenge. So, Maggie, are you still yeah. here? Um, yeah. yeah. As health and social care <coughs> services become increasingly fragmented, how can we ensure people who have multiple needs um, don't get left out? For example, people with mental health problems as well as substance misuse problems. Ruth. I, th I think that's a really good question. I think one of the things that um, we're trying to do at the moment is to stop that fragmentation of health and social care and, and we've got specific um, pieces of work that we're developing to make sure that we're bringing health and social care much closer together around people who, who need that support and um, doing, I mean I think uh, we've already talked a bit about making sure that we're doing holistic assessments of individuals not just taking a diagnosis or, or a slice of a person's life but trying to look at that that person as a whole and we're doing a lot of work and I'm sure it's happening right across health and social care to make sure that we're not working in silos and we're, we're working and developing this concept of personalised care um, and um, we, we've still got barriers and boundaries to the way that we work so in older person services for instance we're now across Hampshire and it's happening in Port it's happened already in Portsmouth developing developing integrated care teams around primary care so that we've got GPs um, social care professionals healthcare community nurses and mental health staff engaged in that process and I was having a conversation the other day with our substance misuse social workers about how they would play into that they're a very small team for us in um, the county so we won't be able to have one per 
integrated care team, but certainly we can make sure that where a substance misuse issue is identified, that we're drawing down their expertise to, to, to work with an individual or, or to support the staff who are working with that individual. I think the, it's, it's absolutely critical now that, that we develop those holistic services around individuals and recognise that people do have complicated lives and um, there's often more than one thing going on for people and that we need to address that in, in a way in partnership with individuals but in a way that meets their needs holistically. Um, integration. Does anyone do you want to say something about integration and multiple needs? Or? No, just to echo yeah. really what's been said. So, in, in similarly, in um, drug and alcohol services, a, a much more integrated approach. So that the the recommissioning of services um, in, in Portsmouth again, we've, we've gone down that very much whole person route. But I think we need to do a lot more joint training or or, or improving the training of all our staff so that all staff feel comfortable um, around the board, discussing and talking about mental health and well-being. So we're starting a program, um, it's called MEC, making every contact count for the staff right across the council to be able to have courageous conversations with people about health issues, even though they're coming from housing or um, uh, uh, across the department. We just need to get, get it out of the open of actually having that uh, ability to, to talk and discuss and to share issues at a wider level. And can I, just say, I thought I understood that they were going to have a named person within the team too, who they could refer to in the integrated team. Is that... Is that happening? Because I thought that was going to happen. Certainly, that's a Labour plan. Mm -hmm. And going one stage further... I think further, it should have happened already. Uh, uh, I, thought it had happened. Sorry, look, I thought it had happened. I yeah. thought exactly. That's I why I'm just asking. Because that, when, when, so. the, when the lady said about that it's fragmented, I thought it was coming the other way. Yes. And also with the PIPs, you know, the personal independence plan, um, that should be the budget. And there's going to be one named per professional person to work with the carer or, or the, the patient themselves. And, and, and just so to remember that actually general practitioners have a have a holistic view of um, yeah well they should be they may well be that named person yes. it, it, it depends on on, on the particular yeah. individual but there should be so that that fragmentation shouldn't be happening if it is happening then we need to talk about it but that, that personal oh. care plan is managed by the patient and the patient has the power to manage their own health yes. what we're doing. <coughs> So what we have is what we have is something called a, um, a recovery focus. Now, <coughs> what that means in practice is that we don't define the problem for the person using the service. So in other words, what we do is we actually get the person to say, these are my problems and this is how I will define recovery. So we don't just say you have these symptoms. When these symptoms are gone, then we declare you well. What we do is when, once people come in, they actually fill out a question. It's a self determined question that they say these are the problems that I have and this is how I will determine my own recovery and um, part of we built that in conjunction with people who use the service in fact I attended a lecture from uh, service users just two days ago where they were explaining how it feels from their perspective to use the service and all of that so that if an individual is defining what their problems are it is unlikely that we will miss the different strands of problems including social alcohol misuse substances and even mental health or physical health it's more likely because it is the person themselves who defines what the problems are so we've got two people trying to get in here so first one here anytime i've been involved with mental health services because actually greater fragmentation in my case i have an eating disorder and i also have other mental health problems and just this last few weeks, I've been told that I can't access any help or support for my eating disorder until I had specific treatments for my mental health, when it's actually my eating disorder that's having a bigger effect on my Mental. life at the moment. So I think fragmentation is a big Still problem. There. Too. Yeah, Rachel Perkins this morning said, how can we better help people get a life? Hmm. Well, I should yeah. point out that this is a specific commissioning issue, that it, it's not actually commissioned in, in Portsmouth properly. Um, the eating disorders is commissioned separately from the mental health, uh, actually provided by separate providers. So I would actually agree with you there. There is fragmentation. So interesting one, the service provision might be attempting to be coordinated with commissioning is not joined up at the back. And so that's an interesting comment. Thanks for that. We appreciate it. I just want to make a good example of some particular partnership work in the course of around um, dual diagnosis really and how 
um, so that the provider of secondary adamant health service and the substance misuse service are working really well together in terms of um, building those partnerships. And I think we're having kind of monthly um, working group meetings where the providers are kind of challenging each other's mm -hmm. practice, and it's really healthy, I think, and it's kind of yeah. progressed more than it has, I think, in the last few years. Dual diagnosis has been a big issue for a number of years now, but I think we're starting to kind of turn a corner. Can I just say as well, I think I think we're also trying to push it one step forward to moving away from this kind of deficit model of understanding what, what people went, want to exactly that conversation about what what is it the like what what is the life that you want, want to live to and what are the barriers that are getting in the way mm. and addressing those barriers for people and so we there, there's been a definite shift over the last year and it, it, it is a cultural change and we're having to work on it and we've by no means got there but really beginning now to, to move it's not just a holistic assessment but but looking at building on people's strengths and breaking down the barriers to the, to the life that they want to live and we're having those conversations I was with a big staff group this morning just having that conversation about how can we shift from that kind of welfareist paternalistic we approach to that that much more um, supportive Excuse approach me, how can we when she's not getting the support that she needs it's putting her back yes. instead of forward and I, I understand that we don't get it right all the time and we've got a long way so to go eating disorders in the city no. is a joke yeah Richard, do you want to say something quickly on this issue? Uh, I, I think um, I think you know part of the problem is we we go to our GP, uh, we uh, present with whatever condition, and then we are referred on to a specialist. Mm -hmm. And uh, do specialists, if we have more than one condition, do specialists ever talk to each other? No, and that role of the GP absolutely uh, crucial. Um, but um, so I, I think I think I just wonder as I've been listening to the answers if we've we've slightly missed a trick here. Whenever we whenever in Solent Mind we uh, survey the people who use our services, we find that between a third and a half of and these, so there is there's all people with uh, mental health issues say that they also have a physical health mm -hmm. issue. And which kind of gets you wondering, well, is it a physical health issue that's caused a mental health issue or, or vice, vice versa? And uh, you know, a bit of a, an academic problem, really. The reality is, as, you know, as people have been saying, you've got, you know, you've got a person and your job then is to deal with that whole person. But I do think that um, uh, health services are not set up to do that except at uh, GP level. And I just wonder if there's a specialism around generic care whole person care that needs to be developed in secondary health services. Mm. Interesting. So I speak to that? Yeah, okay, I've got a few more questions to get to before the end or I'll get in trouble. So. We do deal okay, well, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. We do we do we do deal with the physical care in the sense that once it is recognised that there's a physical problem we actively look for it. We are supposed to actively look for it. Yeah. And we do we do have a matron who is only dedicated who's dedicated solely to physical assessments and physical care both in the inpatient we're trying to get funding for one in the community and it is it is expected of the doctors that they would look at the physical care as well as the mental uh, as well as the mental health care mm. and if it is not being recognized it will be seen on our part as a failure so we do we do look into that at the same time mm -hmm. most of the time what would happen is either if it requires specialist care we refer to the general hospital and if it requires GP care we will tell the GP that look we found this when we were assessing this person we've done this can you continue with that so it is it is something that is expected and if it is not happening it is a failure on our part but it should be happening okay Sandy Walker you have a question on a different topic yes I do um, access to the arts so music theatre art etc are regarded by many as a, a human right uh, almost, and um, there is increasing evidence that the use of the arts in healthcare has a transformational effect on recovery, which often surpasses the effect of traditional treatments. What is the panel's opinion on this, and are there any plans um, that you know of to increase public access to the arts locally, particularly for marginalised groups? Does anyone? 
Karen? Well, I've certainly used the arts in my work with young people, group work, poetry, drama, reenacting, stopping the scene. What would you have done in this situation? And uh, I worked for two years in St Luke's, which is now Charter Academy, with some very disaffected pupils who were writing poems about their <coughs> life experiences, the things that were hitting them every day. Um, lots of bullying issues where the bully was facing the victim and vice versa. We were doing exercises with them and they didn't realise what effect their bullying was was on the, on the victim. It's a sort of simple exercises. But, so I am a big advocate of bringing the arts in uh, as a therapeutic for, for all of us. Our creative side is important to, to develop, um, to be a whole person. I think, I mean, certainly, um, I mean, it, with um, support for people with dementia, there's a growing evidence base that the use of music, and um, I was listening to the radio this morning, the use of poetry with people who experience dementia is a way of communicating with people and, and um, uh, um, enriching their lives in a way that other um, other techniques have, have failed and, and we've um, certainly promoted and it's part of the early intervention and prevention um, strategy is um, uh, silver singing groups across the county and other access to, to art based um, activities because we recognise that um, and, we, and within um, and certainly within some of our mental health commissioning we've we have commissioned some small elements of art-based activity but um, I think with, with reducing resources that we've experienced that's of often been one of the things that's been first to go which is, is really difficult but I absolutely um, recognise the value of, of, that, of releasing people's creativity in all sorts of different artistic ways is, is beneficial for people's mental health and their physical health as well. Richard you've got a scheme where people get prescription to then go and work in mines gardens. Mm -hmm. What about prescriptions to pay for membership of rock choir or something else? Uh, yeah, great idea, isn't it? Yeah, we do. I mean, we have a, uh, a scheme at Mayfield, which is a horticultural uh, therapy uh, uh, project in uh, uh, in Southampton. Um, we do have a, a scheme uh, gets a tiny bit of uh, money from uh, the NHS, and um, people come along and they do gardening with us. So uh, we run the, uh, the glass houses. They come in and uh, help with uh, some of some of the activities. So uh, and they think it's fantastic. We think it's fantastic. It's G GPs who are referring, they think it's fantastic too. So uh, another unexplored area. But you're absolutely right, and as Ruth says, there's some, uh, there's a growing evidence base, uh, particularly around uh, music. I mean, we've heard about art therapy for uh, for donkeys years, but uh, music therapy is really good evidence around. Uh, and a piece of research I was uh, reading was uh, I think it was 50 to 60 year old women and uh, and you can kind of see the logic of it can't you people coming together for a joint purpose and engaging in something which is fun and which is challenging and where you are part of a group I mean you know the social all of the benefits you can you can just imagine that that uh, go with that so uh, yeah, and, and Ruth is absolutely right those kinds of services have been uh, those that have been most easily cut by local authorities. I don't actually know what the situation is here in uh, Portsmouth, mm -hmm. but generally across the country, those have been vulnerable. So why do you want to be one of the first to close interruption <coughs> when it's the most successful place for people with mental health problems to go? They go out five days a week doing things. One gardening, they go up to the healthy lines, they help up there, they do all sorts of things. There's something on every day of the week. You're cutting their money again. I'm innocent on that. You can blame everyone else around. You've seen what a fantastic thing this is. What a fantastic thing interaction is. They're now struggling again to get their money this year if they get anything at all. Into action, it's called. And it's just, it's a fantastic thing. They lost their minibus last year, so they can't get out to the city now without having to cost them a huge amount of money to go out. So therefore they've got things around the city, they're out every day of the week. And this is what they need, they're meeting up, they're meeting up with their friends, they're going out and about, doing things.
Carolyn, you were trying to get in. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say something at the Good Mental Health Conference. We were a kind of collective of community groups and enterprises, and quite a few of those are involved in um, creative activities of different kinds, so creative writing, drama, um, music, singing, and so on. And, they, and what we've got is kind of quite isolated community groups who are kind of struggling to get little bits of funding for themselves. And, uh, and, we, and we're trying to work together. But what, where I think, um, I think community arts is something very, it should be really high on the public health agenda. And not just, a, not just about local government or the health service providing those things. I think we should be looking at building resources within the community which are, can be sustainable with a small amount of help um, rather than kind of projects being projected on the from a kind of point of view. And I think the arts type creative activities can be really inclusive as well. So it's you know it's not about having a label over your head which entitles you to go to a, a treatment. It's about the opportunity to, as we were saying earlier, about recovery and being able to live a life. But there's a there's a much more inclusive atmosphere around creative activities, and I'd really like to see a lot more community investment. And so I wonder what the mm. I think a big shout out for rock choir in that regard. But you've been <laughs> trying to get. I would absolutely support what you said, and I think it's it, rather than say, it say commissioning specific um, uh, different groups, it, it's facilitating that to happen. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in, in Portsmouth, we recognise actually we need to be far more engaged uh, at kind of community level. Um, are now looking to work um, in, in localities across the kind of north, central, and south. Of of the city, so where we can start, you know, mapping out what resources, <coughs> what assets, what buildings there are that we can help make sure are available and provided and, and, and fully used by community groups. So en enabling um, community groups to have um, opportunities to, to flourish um, and, and become sustainable. So that I'd be very much that's my trouble. Would, would that be for free? I, I mean, I think that's the essential thing because the biggest cost for all these community groups is the hiring, the renting of the hall. But everything else is normally free because uh, people give their time and, and the help. I'm quite interested in your 50 to 60 year old women. I fit into that category. Is it in Portsmouth? You should be singing. <laughs> <laughs> I shall go and do some singing. But no, I mean, uh, music is particularly important, I think. And, and uh, we all know that if you listen to a, a piece when you were younger, you know, it takes you straight back. And I think a lot of, particularly in dementia and people like that, it's really important that they have that link and then they can sort of recognise tunes so they don't feel that they're out of it completely. So I, I fully endorse, but I would like to see community groups using it with free spaces like perhaps here or the Cathedral Innovation Centre and to be given that free so that they can, they can do it. There's something called South Sea Greenhouse, I don't know if any of you are uh, uh, members, but that is a fantastic resource. You know, we can, you can go and potter down there um, and it needs to be open more often, but you can go and actually do the garden any time. And then you, you begin to feel normal because you're not having to go to a group where there's, it, everybody's got the same problems. There's a place for that, but also you need to be able to go and mix with the community and feel normal again. I think that's very much part of the recovery, isn't it? Just trying to get in here. I did pick up on the issue of, of having things provided free. I don't think necessarily free is what's required, mm -hmm. because many of us are very willing to pay towards things, but often access to arts related activities is extremely expensive um, and so many people are just excluded from it. There's also a lot of evidence to suggest that we value things more if we do actually pay something for them. So I would go down the route that the budget is free. Well, I mean and also then that helps with maintaining and, and uh, you know, keeping things going on. It's interesting in Southampton they're transferring the ownership of their 18 community centres into the hands of the community. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the groups will own the asset rather than the housing revenue account or others, so there's different strategies in these spaces uh, as well. Um, now, John, Jeffs, you've waited a long time, you've got a question about waiting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, the major mental health charities are for maximum waiting time to be set for critical mental health care and support, including talking therapies. There's an anecdotal evidence of people having to wait up to a year for support. 
Um, are there any proposals for maximum waiting times to be set, given there is a continual reduction of services? Okay, in terms of service provision, do you want to start on the hospital side first? And then we'll come to the politicians and then the... Okay, so there is already a, there is already a target for things like IAP, which, is, um, which basically was designed to release um, talking therapies with them. They already have a target. It's primary care room, and it's not... Um, I don't think that's what you're talking about, because there is no way you would have to wait for a year to access IAP. It's through your GP, it's when you go to your GP and you need a talking therapy, they should be able to arrange that directly. So I think what you're talking about is the longer talking therapies, things like um, psychodynamic psychotherapy or um, DBT. I think that's what you're talking about. Now, the problem is one of not being, it's a problem of, of having happened over a, a certain number of years. So if, if a particular service hasn't been valued, not by the users of the service, but by the commissioners around the government, the expertise leaves, basically people just go away. So things like family therapy, for example, which I find extremely useful in many mental illnesses, we don't have any because it's not commissioned and people with expertise have left. Many people, friends of mine, have actually left the country. There are targets around, there are waiting time targets. Sometimes, they don't do it anymore, but they used to do something called waiting list therapy, where they would keep you on a waiting list and they would make you wait, and then by the time your turn around, you'd already be well, so you wouldn't need it anymore. <laughs> they used to do that. They don't do that anymore, but they used to do that. Or dead. Yeah, whichever. You know. Does it work with broken limbs as well? <laughs> <laughs> um, it didn't apply. <laughs> Right now, because of what because of what is funded, there are specific there are specific um, treatments that are available. Things like you know the kind of thing that you'd have to wait a year for is something like psychodynamic psychotherapy, and there's the dwindling expertise around that left. There are very there are few practitioners who still do it, even though it has its own place. Things like DBT, for example, you should you know there is also a long waiting list for that, largely because a lot of people need it. And again, not enough practitioners to supply it. So what am I telling you? Yes, the problem that you mentioned does exist. The solution to it is something that I do not know. Do you want to just explain to me what DBT is? Yeah. DBT is dialectic behavioral therapy. So I'm pretty sure everybody in this room has heard of um, personality disorders. Um, people with personality disorders basically use up most of the time of, me of mental health services. Um, they are extremely needy, they suffer immensely, but also their families suffer immensely. Um, there is actually no, there's no cure or there's no evidence-based treatment that works every single time. DBT is something that works probably half of the time. So if you have a hundred patients who have personality disorders, it will probably help in about half. And that is our most effective treatment for it. Everything else is hit or miss. But because there are, again, there are a large number of people who require it, it means there will be a large waiting list. But again, I don't know the solution to that. What, what do you think, Joe? More, jo more training? Is more cognitive therapy. It is similar to it, but, uh, but you, could, you could say it evolved from it. What do, what do you think, John? Um, well, I'm told that, you know, um, the one report I'm told that it says that one in six people attempt suicide. Yeah while they're waiting for suitable treatment and support. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert. I, you know, I haven't got the answer. You know, I think it, it has to come from government policy, really. And, and I think they've no, brought I don't that know that involves setting targets or, or whatever. Well, I think they've just brought in the, the crisis care concordat. Yes. Mm -hmm. The crisis Which, concordat has come in. But Okay. Does it not work? Well, no, I, I, I'm bound to you because I don't know whether it's working or not. We're still talking about we're meeting. We're about to we're, sign it on Friday. Okay. It. But actually, the, the Concordat is a, a sign up by partners to say they will try and address um, addressing people's needs who are in crisis. Yeah. So I mean, it's fine to sign a bit of paper, but we've actually got to make a service work now. Yeah, exactly. We need, we need resources okay. to make that work. So the principle is there, we've yes. just got to make it work. That's great. Well, at least we're, we're moving forward, I suppose. On no, that. I've been on your committee for the first crisis, and we've been through it all. I've brought it up every time we've been at a meeting. This problems, this problems. Crisis needs to be taken away and something else put in its place.
because the staff are always the time. You phone them up for help. She's on that different track. And I think this is this is an opportunity to to this is an opportunity to rethink it and redesign yeah. it so it well, does I've work. Well, I've been on that because yeah. I see you've know, been at meetings every month to try and get it before it went to you, as far as you. Right. And it's still was on heck of so, so, so what we've got to do is make sure that it works and and, uh, well, and make, make sure it continues I don't as think well. With, with what's come out of it is going to work. Right. And okay. a lot of us don't. Perhaps, perhaps we need to hear about that. So. But talking about the long waits for, I mean, I read the manifesto from, by Mind, and it, the things which really struck out were, were the people who said how long they've had to wait, and it's, it's, it's horrendous, you know, waiting for a whole year. I don't know whether we can bring extra people in to sort of get the waiting list going so that you actually are able to do it earlier, but I mean, it's, it's a, a massive problem and something we've really got to look at. Um, maybe, as I say, with the mental health being pushed up to the top of the agenda, um, it, maybe we can get more people trained or whatever, so... And I suppose yeah, one of the one of, the one of the complex things in this space as well with mental health is that you can admit and churn fast to reduce your waiting list and that was certainly one of the criteria being used by the CCGs for units. Admit, stabilise, discharge and you've hit your target quite, quite quickly. Can more resources be found? That's the last final question to the politicians. Or what, I mean we talked about service reform, we've talked about the role of the voluntary sector, we've talked about two and a half billion pounds, be good to say where that's coming from. Um, and then just one last comment from the other panels, uh, really, to close in terms of what you think the priority is locally, and by the locality that could be Portsmouth or Hampshire or your, your patch. So just kind of one final round, and I'll start with Sue. I mean, uh, when we can't even get a GP appointment for two weeks, uh, uh, you, you don't even get enough of the starting blocks, are you? Um, so Labour have pledged to put more resources into the NHS, do that joined up approach, um, reduce your waiting times to see a GP to 48 hours, but the NHS is in crisis because there are practices closing down, either closing down, the older GPs are retiring, we haven't got a wealth of young people coming through, being trained, and I believe the training can be up to 10 years uh, to bring them through. Uh, as for specialist services, it may be even longer, but it does need an investment in, in training young people and encouraging them to go in to the specialist services and also into the G general practice work. Um, uh, it does need more resources. It does mean investing in the NHS if we want to keep the NHS and all the other associated services that we want to bring in together on an equal parity. Um, uh, so we are pledging to put put money in into the NHS and reduce those waiting times. We did have reduced uh, uh, target waiting times in hospitals under our administration, so we definitely want to get back to that position again uh, and, uh, you know, invest in the NHS, basically, uh, in cash terms. Darren. Coming back to the, the previous question, um, I had someone talking this week, and she said every single time she calls up the crisis mental health unit, she's told to go to the police. Yeah. The word she used to me was crisis. So I'm delighted that we're going to sign the crisis care can call out, which is something that the Democrats have insisted on in government. The idea is that no person in crisis should be turned away. Um, that's got to be crucial. You can't have, as I had when I used to live in London, the sight of people in crisis being told to go to A&E hospital, A&E wards, because that is just completely and utterly wrong. I think that's the biggest single mental health issue facing this city right now. I think the next issue is, is to integrate health and social care, to, to strip out the, the artificial divide that Janet was talking about earlier on, so that we can pull expertise and pull budgets. My party's increase, the Democrats' increase, wants to increase the, the NHS budget in real terms during the next Parliament, and actually also work to end the stigma. Money is crucial, but so is changing, so is changing attitudes, whether it's at school, whether it's within the professions, whether it's amongst people. You've got to change attitudes. We've changed the law. It's like how racism was 40 years ago. We've changed the law. We've now got to change people's attitudes. And none, not the attitudes of the people in this room, but the people who aren't here. That's what we've got to change. So it's about integration, 
increasing the money in real terms and changing people's attitudes. And I think those are the three things that are most important over the next five years. Um, well, I think every party is committed to the NHS. I think you know everybody has said that they would either increase or they would keep the budget, um, and that's absolutely right. I mean, we've put a massive amount in. We've got six thousand more doctors, as I said before. We have twelve point seven billion. Um, I could go on to a long political thing, but I don't want to. What I'm most interested in, though, is how we move forward in Portsmouth, which is what I'm really interested in. Um, and I think the integrated care is the way forward, and we've got to make sure that it works. So I will be looking at that and working with everybody I can to do that. Um, the, the crisis can call it, I think, it's really exciting if it works, because that means that people will get sorted very quickly. So it's looking, trying to look at how we move forward um, and, and, and trying to make sure that everybody, whether it's an organisation I'll be supporting or an individual, um, and I'm very interested to talk about the um, eating disorder problem, um, that's, that's how I see my role, really, is supporting and driving it forward. Okay, and can I come to you first? Yes, I, um, now I've had a really interesting uh, career in the NHS um, and moved from general practice into public health. And for me, now standing back from the NHS and in, in, in the local authority setting and looking back, I don't think money is just the problem. It is, it, is an, it is an issue, it is a real issue, but it's actually thinking of the way we do things and the systems we, we use and stopping waiting for things to get too bad. And the more we can do upstream <coughs> on a preventative basis of, of, of using, when we talk about where, where do we get the resources from, the resources are within us within us as individuals, with us and families um, and, and, and our social networks and our communities and the society we live in. And we need to do things differently um, to help support ourselves uh, and other people and for public services to make that easier for us to do. Ruth. Yes, I, I think it's important to recognise that we've had integrated health and social care adult mental health services for 10 years or so with social workers and social care staff sitting in integrated side side. teams side yes. by side with, with our colleagues in the NHS and the mental health services in lots of ways have led the way around integrated care. There's a lot of learning we could take about how we can do it better but it's important and I think um, if there were two messages that I, I wanted to leave is one, don't forget social care. Um, everybody's talking about defending the NHS um, and the importance of the NHS. Absolutely <coughs> don't um, want to take anything away from that, but social care is an absolutely integral plank of the delivery of services, and um, um, we need to have that recognised. And again, working with my staff um, this morning, they were saying it's all about the NHS, but nobody, um, I think, a understands what we do, and certainly social care staff don't feel highly valued but a, a good partnership between health and social care can deliver some good outcomes for people and I think the other thing that um, I would like to see going into the future is to hear the voice of those people who use services and their carers in the planning and commissioning of services um, much louder than we've had at the moment. Um, people are very, we've got person-centred delivery of services <coughs> but I think we need to um, see the engagement of, of people in, in planning different sorts of services that meet needs um, in a different sort of way. Thank you. And Tate. If, if there's one thing I'd like to see, it's stability. I'm, you know, so many changes which tend to be determined by politics happen in a very cyclical way. We just see it over the years. I would really like to even stay still, even if I don't even get better resources. Leaving with the same thing for a period of time so we can actually actually sit down and breathe and actually do something with it. There are so many changes we have to implement because of changes in policy that occur from, from one year to the next to the next to the next. And that can't be good for the people that we look after. And my second what a second two of the things is that there's there can be no mental health without social care. It's just impossible. It can't be done. And as well, we need to hear more from the people who use the service and more from the carers. A lot more, a lot louder. From my perspective, um, they're too complacent. We need more noise. <laughs> I wish everybody were like you. And we go to meetings, yes. and we don't we get, we, we don't get anything out of them. She's part of the carers council, and we still don't get I think I think you all need to go to the pub afterwards. And <laughs> 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 can I just say, you two, 
Um, a point I wanted to make that carers and service users are not consulted, and I was going to ask why. And I will tell you they are not consulted, listened to, or acknowledged. I'm, uh, my son is in the intensive um, engagement team. I helped to set it up. I'm Thelma Turner Hill. I'm chair of the Carers Council. I'm also a carer for some with schizophrenia. I helped to set it up about 12 years ago. It's really successful from another carer. Oh, do you know that it's finishing? I was not consulted. I was not asked. I was not informed. And actually, ladies and gentlemen, at this meeting tonight, there is another carer here whose daughter is in that team. And while I went to get um, uh, a drink of water, I told her, do you, do, you know that it, do you know it's closing down? And she didn't know, and it's closing in three weeks' time. So please don't say that you want more input from carers and service users, because professionals do not. Professionals make the decisions. <coughs> it is a, the, the intensive engagement team isn't going away. The staff are still there. They're, all in, they're just integrated to the North team. They're still there, yes. available to provide that function. Yes, yeah, I do realise the, the <laughs> position, but actually being told of change, I found from another carer, and, I, and I've spoken to lots of carers as chair of the Carers Council, and all carers think they're not listened to, then they're, they're, what they think is not important. The very important professionals make the decisions, and then you find out, for me to come to this meeting in this hall and to tell another carer, this is oh yeah, it's happening in three weeks' time, and she was aghast. Well, I haven't heard about well, it. But it isn't happening. It isn't happening. And we have built into all our systems consultation with carers and, no. and the services. Like, I disagree finish. with you, but finish well, on finish. that subject and go on to more important things. Well, I think one. Just, no, but, what, but I just, just, just need to address that. I okay. need to address that. It's very important. Um, you can ask, actually, you can ask the gentleman right behind you over there. We do consult carers, we do consult services. It is built in. To the process of any change, and if we don't, if we, if we don't, if we don't, we're actually held to account for it. No, not really, because they're not, you're not found out. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, going away. yeah, that service isn't going away. I'm chair away. of the carers' council, and I was not aware of all this. And I represent lots of carers, and they were not aware. And a lady tonight was and not I'm aware. I'm saying it again. That service isn't going away. I manage that service. That service is not going Okay, away. so can we can we carry yeah. that so on I'm conversation up? No, it's a very important point. I was at something last night where there were 40 carers being listened to and people with mental health challenges. And one of the issues there that was being pointed out is that carers in this space are not as organised as they are in some other spaces, so they're not swapping notes as quickly. And that's one of the ways that we lose out. And just for the record, it's not Ruth that's doing any cutting in the city, all right? She's, <laughs> she's, she's, she's no, 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 I'm just, just, just no, it's just you. You, you, you said you, both of them. So. And, and uh, for the final word, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Mind and to Richard from Solar Mind. So. Uh, thanks. We, we've talked a lot about um, stigma, and uh, Mind is one of the leaders of the Time to Change uh, campaign. One of the things that, my, that Time to Change does is it measures changes in public attitudes attitude towards mental health, so changes, if you like, in uh, levels of, of uh, stigma. And uh, things have been improving over the last few years, since Time to Change came along, which is about uh, four years ago. Um, but Time to Change is now uh, beginning to direct uh, one of its initiatives to people working in the NHS, because that's where the battle against stigma is actually lagging behind. And that includes in mental health services uh, themselves. So um, uh, that's, uh, I think, quite an important uh, statement around uh, uh, the anti-stigma uh, work that uh, we're doing and where resources need to be uh, directed. And so the final thing about, uh, we've talked a lot about putting users in charge. We've had a, an illustration a moment ago about basic communication yeah. appearing to, to fall down. If that's the beginning of putting users in charge, then uh, it feels like we've got a, a way to go. One of the reasons I feel very optimistic, actually, about the future of mental health services is that we are talking more and more about uh, uh, bringing users of services into delivering mental health services and uh, designing and leading mental health services as well. We're involved in the peer support uh, initiatives in Southampton and in Hampshire. So that's where we are employing people who have lived experience, who can draw on their experience of what it is like to be in the system in order to inspire others, and I am inspired 
uh, by what they can bring to mental health services. So on that positive note, I'd like to uh, thank of our panelists. Thank you for coming and perhaps we show our appreciation in the traditional way.